Are you looking for new books to read? Do you like finding a new special author? Are you tired of the same old books from the same old authors? Well then, welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths, a podcast where you can hear from fantastic new authors. Join Steven Schneider as he finds and talks to authors you may not know, but authors that have worked hard to write great new books. Hear about their book and why you should check it out. So sit back and listen to today's Discovered Wordsmith. Good morning and welcome to episode 135 of Discovered Wordsmiths. This is a great special episode for me. You'll notice it's just one episode. I don't have this one split into multiple, uh, but there is a related chapter read. Uh, the reason is because this author is a little different. It is a memoir of somebody who has lived a very full life recording in our movie and music industry. Uh, you will hear a lot of movies and directors and names, uh, composers that you may recognize like Steven Spielberg and John Williams. So I was very excited for this episode, being a musician and hearing uh, all the great movie scores that this lady has uh, sung with, been in, been a part of, and everything she's done. Uh, her book recounts a lot of these stories, and she reads a little bit of it for us at the end. So as you can tell, uh, background, hat, it's Christmas week. We're a couple days away. I'm very excited. I love Christmas myself. For all you haters out there, I'm sorry. but uh, So I thought this was a great episode for this week. It happened to fall very well. Uh, I am looking forward to the new year. I've gotten a Christmas story done this year that I'm giving out to my kids, and I may not get it out this year to everybody, but I'm holding on to it for next year, uh, hopefully. So I wish everybody a very Merry Christmas. May you get many books in your stockings, and may you have plenty of time to read as we ha head into the uh, deeper, darker winter months. Uh, here in Ohio, we have a major storm coming Christmas Day. Not a lot of snow, but a lot of cold and wind. So I may have some extra time for reading or writing. So Merry Christmas, all. Here's Sally. So, uh, Sally, welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths. Uh, I'm very excited to talk to you today. Um, it's a, one of my other passions is music, mm -hmm. and I've been getting back into playing more music again. So I think this will be a great discussion. I can't wait to hear some of your achievements. Uh, and for those of everyone else joining in that has not read the press release or anything, um, tell them a little bit about who you are and where you live and some of the things you like to do, which, I, I mean, you're not really an author. It just, you're writing about your life. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you. Um, I live in Studio City, California, and I've worked in uh, in the music business here in Hollywood for the last 60 years, literally. The first film score I sang on was How the West Was Won in 1961. And uh, some of the more recent ones were Deadpool 2. And nice. uh, yeah. I've never had to give a cutoff before on You Can't Stop This Mother, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but it, it, it's uh, it's been a, a wonderful journey. I, I, I'm blessed to have made it stretch this long. I think the reason it lasted so long was I, I started out for the first 25 years or so just singing. I was a session, what they call a session singer, and I did solo cues. I did some solo cues in Clute, and I sang the lullaby in Secret of Nim, and you know, that, that kind of thing. But... Um, most of my work has been choral, choral underscoring. In back in the variety TV days, I worked on Danny Kay variety show. Um, I did some vocal cues for Murder She Wrote, and you know that era, um, we worked a lot in television and film scoring. And then about twenty five years into that journey, um, I had a chance. I never wanted to what they call vocal contracting. It's like that's when you put together a choir or a small group for a, a composer. Um, and I'd never wanted to do that because I, I thought of it as something very political. And I thought the other contractors wouldn't want to hire me if I did it. Well, it turned out exactly the opposite. It's it's really what allowed me to to be active in the business this long. 
because um, it, it gives you a closer connection with the composers, with the project. You have to shape the sound to be what the composer needs. So um, that's that was a blessing too to be to begin that work. And I've done um, vocal contracting, put choirs together for John Williams and Mark Shaman, Alan Silvestri, and you know a lot. You of say the- John Williams, please, please tell me some of the work you've done that he's composed. Oh well, you know the first thing I did with John was a film called Amistad. I don't know. If oh you're wow! In- it's the uh, I. I don't. I can't tell you the year exactly, but it was a Steven Spielberg film. It was a brilliant film about. And the story was that the journey of these people who were put on a slave ship and brought across the Atlantic and loaded into the states here, and they were able to resist becoming that what which they'd been brought here to become, the slaves. And there was a trial, and they were able to return to their home country. It was very, uh, it was a wonderful project. And the reason I got to do it with John was because I had done a film for Hans Zimmer called The Power of One, which w- which okay. also involved African music, authentic African music. And with um, with Amistad, it, it was... Um, it, it had to be authentic there. We had someone on this, on the scoring stage to help us with the pronunciation of the words and so forth. But it, it also had, it, it was, it was John's music, which also has a touch of the classic um, approach to music. So the choir was, I believe it was either 48 or 52 voices. And we worked about four or five days with those sessions. We had some days we had just a women's choir, some days a men's choir, and then mostly it was combined. And we also had like a 48 voice children's choir in that film. And um, it was, uh, it, there was one cue that I went to John's office to look at with, and in those days he still used a movieola, which was the, there was none of this, digital stuff and we looked at this cue and this was a very emotional cue there was a on the ship as they were coming across wrapped in chains was this lovely young woman who was about to be made a slave and you could tell by the expression on her face she was not on for this ride and she was sitting on the edge of the ship you know for the bow or whatever the wall that goes around the deck and she was and in slow motion with all these chains she falls back into the ocean, into the water and waves and sinks down. And John had written a solo cue for that uh, scene, that shot. And he had to find the right voice for it. It had to have an ethnic quality, but it had to just be the right emotional voice. So I gathered some demo tapes from singers here in LA, which is part of what the contractor does. And, And they were all wonderful, but they weren't quite right. John listened to them all. I had to be in New York for meetings for the trustees of the uh, After Pension and Health Fund. So I thought, well, while I'm here, maybe I'll audition some of the young ladies at Juilliard, and that would be exciting for them. And so we did that. But again, nothing was quite right. And then someone told me that there was a new opera uh, director up in San Francisco and that I should reach out to him, and I did. And he told me about a, a young lady, Pamela Dillard, uh, who was on the road at that moment doing classical tours. And I contacted her. She was in Birmingham, Alabama at the moment. And, you know, sometimes you you just get this. You just know. I talked to her. Talking to her on the phone, I knew this was the right person. And she sent a recording, and John loved it. And he wrote two more solo cues for her for the film. So that was that was my first experience with John. But John is the most gracious. I talk about him a bit, quite a bit in the book. He's the most beloved, gracious, gifted man in the business, I think. And everybody who's ever worked for him would say the same thing. We had, there was one little solo cue that we had to audition a couple of boys for on a trailer that we did for one of the Harry Potter movies. It was another kids group. Uh, yeah. And, and we, I thought there were two little boys that I thought might be the right little boys. So I had them both audition, sing to the track for John. And rather than, you know, have one of them be disappointed in front of their friends, he just said, well, we'll, we'll pay them both. We'll, and then we'll decide later who we'll use. So I'm, that's so typical of how he does things. That's nice. Yeah. So, so you've started off mostly as a singer and progressed into 
more of the administration uh, work, but did you keep singing? Oh, uh, yeah. You, in order for you, the, 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 a vocal contractor is a SAG after a covered job, and you must be a singing, a performing part of the singer group. And the reason that they put that into place back in the or late 50s, I think, that was added to the contract, was that there needs to be someone out there on the risers or in the room around the mic with the small group to communicate with the with the producer and the composer uh, who's in the booth. And, and you need somebody that's knowledgeable about the community, that's part of the community. So the, the role of vocal contractor sort of floated to the surface out of the community of singers. And um, maybe a, a composer, a particular composer or a particular music department would think someone was doing a really good job. And, and that, uh, re- that contact or relationship deepens um, so that I, when I began contracting, and the first score I contracted for was a Danny Elfman score. It was Beetlejuice. And it was a small group, just, uh, I think it was six or eight of us, I always forget. And then... Uh, I had done also. I had done Pee Wee's Great Adventure. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, and formerly a wonderful singer and contractor, by Ron Hicklin, who was very. We were all very much a part of the business in the Wrecking Crew days. If you know about the Wrecking Crew, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Side awesome. by <laughs> side by side with them all, from nine to. I, you know, when I started to write this memoir, I'm getting off track. So pull me back if you need. No, to. please. <laughs> But when I started to write this memoir, I, I dived into my journals and date books that I'd kept over the years. I must have 50 of them. And I found, um, you know, uh, paper, calendar books, date books from 1965 and 69, 72. And in, as I looked through those days, I had forgotten that the union covered activity in this town was so active, so busy that there would be a nine o'clock session, a 12 o'clock session, maybe a two or three o'clock session or a five o'clock session and nine, a seven to 10 session. It went on from nine in the morning to midnight, many times, six days a week. And, and uh, that there were a lot, nothing paid a whole lot. Cause in those days, I, when I wasn't contracting, you'd write down in the calendar book, the time, the ca- capital studio, two o'clock um, Johnny man contractor or whatever. But I didn't know what the project was. And then, but when I got my paycheck, then I'd indicate the, the amount that came and the date that it came. And some of those checks were $9.27 or, <laughs> you know, it, it, in those days, the, the demos for jingles didn't pay a lot. But the good thing was that it was all on contract. And if those jingles got used, you were paid according to how they were used, whether it was a national spot or, you know, so... Right. <clears throat> There wasn't a, there was a huge amount of activity. Of course, the pays were the payment was less in those days, but it was it was kind of the golden age, I think, of of our business. I, I yeah, I agree. Now, the the one thing you said, uh, I'm not sure I completely believe you that really you had uh, musicians come in for sessions at 9 a.m. That's like mm-hmm. an ungodly hour for a musician. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Late night, 2 a.m. I could believe that. <laughs> no, we did. We, we worked at uh, <clears throat> Western sometimes and, and often the artist maybe if, if like we did some stuff with Wayne Newton at the little studios at Western recorders and most of those were afternoon or evening. But um, a lot of the jingles were in the morning, the orchestral things were, and the film scoring was often a nine to five day. It was an eight hour day where the orchestra and the choir uh, or the singers worked together. Then it, it's evolved more. There are still some sessions like that, but there are more sessions where the orchestra records by by section, you know, the rhythm and the horns and the strings and whatever. And then the singers are brought in and they, we sing to those tracks. So it's not right. all in one room like it used to be. Right. And sometimes it is, but not, not. I was going to say, doesn't John Williams do that sometimes for the movies? He'll be playing the movie and recording the score while yes. watching it. Yes. You're on a big, big story <clears throat> scoring stage. And, and also when I started in the business, there was the MGM scoring stage, which is the first one I worked on. It's the place where Judy Garland sang over the rainbow and that studio is now Sony, but the stage is just the same. The scoring stage is just the same. Uh, there was there was 
MGM, there was Fox, the Fox Newman stage, which is still there in its glory, beautiful big stage, and Warner Brothers, which um, <clears throat> Clint Eastwood kind of saved from extinction because the work had slowed down. And the, so he, the, the score there is now called the uh, Clint Eastwood stage at Warner Brothers. And it's also the same big original space. Um, and it accommodates a large orchestra. When we did the, uh, we did a, well, I'm trying to think, we the John Williams projects, we did those vocal sessions as overdubs because the choir was so big. It was 50, 52 voices, you know. <clears throat> but many times we've done the choirs live with the orchestra. Nice, nice. Yeah. So <clears throat> you're, you're a musician, you've sang your whole life. Mm -hmm. What was it like trying to put singing life into written life uh because that seems very uh oh and by the way uh just the fact that you did anything with the wrecking crew is super impressive <laughs> to me i mean i love those so so what, what was it like trying to did you want to do like a storyfied version of your life from you know point a to point b or is it a collection of stories or well, it, it's it's basically uh First of all, regarding the writing, I, I, um, <clears throat> I've always loved writing. I started writing when I was five years old, you know, as soon as I knew what to do with the pen. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, and I've also written, I had a, ch in the beginning, I, can I go back to the very beginning? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 please. <clears throat> when I was at UCLA, um, Herb Alpert, you know, Herb Alpert and Lou, oh, yeah. Adler, Lou Adler, they were partners together in a little office on Sunset Boulevard before either of them had had their tremendous successes. <clears throat> and they were looking for a, a young singer to sing a song that Herb Alpert had written. So a manager took me to see him. I was 19 at the time, I think, 20. And um, and he thought I would be the okay person. So he said, do you have a song for the, the other side of that? that in the, this is the days of single 45 records. So I went home and wrote another song and brought it back and he liked it better than his song. <clears throat> so he said, write another song. And they, he recorded the two songs of, that I'd written. And that's really what I wanted to do. That was my dream. I wanted to be a, an artist. But <clears throat> I got a chance to go on the road with the, that song. But that record, by the way, got to number 10 in Connecticut. But that's as far as it got. <laughs> <clears throat> but I, I shortly thereafter had a chance to tour with Ray Conniff on his first tour as an artist. <clears throat> and doing that, I met some of the other session singers and and I met my first husband. And, and then we ended up going on a long 47 one-nighter bus tour with Ray the next year or, or later in that same year, actually. <clears throat> and And I began to learn more about the session singing business. And, you know, when you have a chance to do that, it, it's it's sort of word of mouth. You, someone recommends you because you did a good job standing next to them or whatever, and it it begins to open up. But it's so competitive that if you don't show up when you're hired, they might find somebody else. So that became really my focus, and and I was very very blessed and very lucky to to just have been at the right place at the right time in many cases. And you get to show what you do if it's a high obligato or something, whatever it might be. Um, I, now I've forgotten the question. <laughs> oh, the right. Uh, <laughs> we were going back to the beginning. I was asking about getting the uh, singing life onto the written onto the right, word yes. page. So um, over the years, I, I kept writing. I did the writing workshops and so forth because I loved it. But I also... Um, always wrote poems and I, and I always wrote lyrics. And the first chance I had to write lyric for a film was a film called On Any Sunday. And it was the sort of the documentary about motorcycling that Steve McQueen was, was featured in. And um, that was for composer Dominic Frontieri. And I, I did several other film projects for him. And then I had a chance to write a lyric for Dave Grusin for a film called Absence of Malice. And it was just a little source cue. It was a, it was a, Christmas song with ch where children were singing, walking into a, a Catholic church. <clears throat> and 20 years later, and he and, and Dave had wanted to write something that sounded kind of old English a little bit, you know, so we did that. So about 20 years later, Dave was involved with James Taylor's first Christmas album. And he reached out to me and said, Sally, can you write a second verse for our little Christmas song? And so I did, because it had been very short in the beginning. <clears throat> and James loved it. And it was in his first and in some of the other uh, 
versions of his Christmas album. It, it's a song called Who Comes This Night. And so that the writing was always a part of what I was doing, but in a very small way, it was just kind of special moments, you know. Um, and when I sat down to write the memoir, it I had I had written you know over the years at those writer workshops I'd done memoir workshops and poetry and fiction and essay and everything, and I'd occasionally write a chapter or two that I thought was an interesting story to tell. So I had some of those together. During the pandemic, it was a wonderful time to edit all this stuff together, <clears throat> and I had two two people that were hugely helpful. One is a wonderful writer himself named uh, Gordon Menninga. And he has he was head of the writing uh, studies at Coe College, and he also taught at the University of Iowa at summer shops workshops. And another one was Laura Munson, who's a woman writer up in Montana, who's had a couple of very successful books. And I sent the uh, memoir to each of them. Gordon sent me back many comments. You know, uh, what, can you expand on this or what, that kind of thing? So. Uh, during the pandemic, though, I, it was when I had a chance to pull this all together. And coincidentally, when you when you do something for fifty five or sixty years, it become for me it just becomes your life. That my community of singers became my family. I was also very very active in the uh, the governance of my unions, Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA, which about ten years ago merged into SAG AFTRA. And so I was on boards and committees and I was participating in the negotiations and everything. And <clears throat> when that begins to slow down, as it does, as you have to expect that at, at a certain age, you know, and there are young singers that have begun to do some contracting and they, they have to, they're entitled to their time. But it was very painful because in the early days, we were very considerate of one another. We didn't talk about other jobs when we were there on the stage. But then Facebook happened, <laughs> and you get to see all these parties that you're not invited to as as that begins to happen. And it was very it was very painful, and it was kind of helpful during the pandemic when things got shut down for six months or so, and you didn't have to look at Facebook and see that happening. And it gave me a period of time to adjust to what was really going on in life for me. It's not over yet. I mean, I just worked on a wonderful project for Seth MacFarlane this last week, but but it's nice. it's not like it was, you know. And so um, the first chapters of the book are kind of from today. It's kind of how, how you feel when you realize that things are changing and you have to adapt. And then I went back and to started with childhood and the family stuff and kind of got into, I think they're probably... 10 chapters before I'm really into the business stories. But my both my parents and my stepfather were all singers also. And my I just recently learned from on Facebook, I, I came in contact miraculously by to this wonderful lady um, who Laura, oh my God, this this is the time of life when you can't remember names. Oh, I can't remember them. So it's not just. <laughs> oh, okay. And she's a, I'll think of her name in a minute, but she's a wonderful writer. And I had posted something, somebody, somebody else had said, oh, I think I know uh, Kenny Stevens' daughter. Somebody posted something about uh, uh, Bob Stevens, who was a session singer. And someone, and, and this guy said, I, I think I know Bob's daughter, Sally. And I posted, no, I'm, I'm not Bob's daughter. I was Kenny Stevens' daughter. And the, and this lady happened to see that. She writes about the early film days, the, the, the actors and singers of the 30s and 40s. And she, she wrote me a note and said, I was a huge fan of your father, Kenny Stevens. And she started to write an article about him. And she has sent me pictures and film clips and sound clips of things I never knew he had done. So wow. it, it was just amazing. So wow. um, anyway, that's kind of I, I knew that there was such a such a job as a session singer, you know, because both my parents did it. My mom sang on The Wizard of Oz. And... Nice. <laughs> nice. So so uh, what type of feedback are you getting from people who have already read the book? <clears throat> Wonderful, kind feedback. I, I'm just so uh, I, I can't believe it. So many friends and people in the business and some people I don't know 
have posted on Facebook. I just ordered the book or just started it or I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's, I've, I've had very good feedback. I'm very grateful for that. Nice. I never expected it to be a widely read book. I just thought it'd be something interesting for people who wanted to get into the business or who particularly love the business. And that's probably what it is. But it's, uh, it's, it's been very warmly received. Great. What I, I got to ask, we, you've mentioned a lot of great movie composers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was probably your favorite thing to sing uh, at some movie, some score or whatever? Oh, my gosh. You know, uh, it, I've sung such beautiful music where it's hard to say which is the favorite. And a lot of things come to mind. One of the early films I did for Danny Elfman was uh, Edward Scissorhands. And, beautiful and movie. He, he, we used a 20-voice women's choir group, and it was this beautiful, I, the, the tone that I love from The Sopranos, which is straight tone and floaty and beautiful. And so that was very special. Um, uh, everything I've done for John has been very special. I did a project for Mark Shaman. I, we did this, a couple of vocal cues from South Park, which was just fun because of the, you know, you don't blame, blame Canada. And, uh, oh, I love that song. <laughs> we did that in the session. Then we did that for the Oscars. I, I also was a choral director for the Oscars for about 22 years. And we did uh, an on-camera choreographed version of that South uh, um, Blame Canada version. And, and Robin Williams was, you know, did the solo and we were all characters behind him. But that's another blessing in my life was that to, to work with Robin Williams. Um, nice. I, I worked on the last uh, TV series that he did called The Crazy Ones. I love that show. Yeah, yeah it was very sad it, when, oh, you know. Heartbreaking. Yeah. We lost him. Um, so, okay, so you mentioned South Park. Uh -huh. I, I, I love that because, I mean, you're talking about Amistad, which yeah. is a very <laughs> deep movie. I mean, it's not a no. comedy or anything. No. And then South Park is just totally off the rails, irreverent. But the music that Matt and Trey do in that, that uh, their show and on that movie and stuff, it's amazing music, really. Yes. It's very well done. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I've also, uh, I haven't worked on the series, but I have worked on, from inception of the shows, I've worked on The Simpsons and Family Guy and American Dad. Um, I the, the main title for The Simpsons that I sing with Danny and uh, Susie uh, Stevens Logan, my daughter also sang on that. That, air, that main title has been running for 33 years. And the Family Guy main title I also sang on. But I, I worked on the shows. As the music team for Simpsons, um, sadly, uh, changed about two or three years ago. So I'm not doing the vocal cues within the shows any longer. But uh, we did all the special, like, um, just just the silly songs, you know, that the village people would sing, or that. And once in a while, I'd do a sound alike end title. I do. I did a little Barbara Streisand version of People, and um, you know, stuff like that. And for Family Guy, we we do we've done cues. Uh, one of them was "You've Got AIDS," which was a scene in one of the episodes. But ironically, you know, um, do, can I tell you a story about that? Please, please. <laughs> Anyone that would want to read your book, this is what they want to hear. This is what would interest them. So please. Well, now some of these little stories I I don't break go into detail with on this on the page. It's more general. But um, first of all, Seth MacFarlane is one of the most amazing, also the kindest, greatest guys in the business. Yeah, he's. I love his he's um, Christmas album. Yes. He's a wonderful singer. He, he values quality music. He's insisting on still in these days using live orchestras to score the Oroville oh. and Family Guy. And I uh, oh, love that. Has some wonderful composers that do his scoring, Walter Murphy. And um, so anyway, uh, we did this, this little song for the call. It was We've Got AIDS. And then a few, and one of the singers on it was a dear gentleman who, who um, who was a gay man, and and it was a sensitive cue for him to do, you know. Um, and some a couple of years later, one of the uh, there was an interview show on one of the public tell or the NPR stations or something. <clears throat> and I I just happened to listen to it because I'm addicted to NPR, 
And it was a young man telling this story about himself having had AIDS and come through it, but it changed the way he related to people as he met them. And he, met, he had met a young man that he was very interested in, wanted to get to know. And, but he was concerned about how to share this information, you know, that he had had AIDS. And they were watching uh, television one night and a rebroadcast of this episode came up and it allowed him to have the conversation with this young man. And, and I, so um, when uh, there was a, there was a request even after that time to reuse, to relicense that cue for some other project. And I had to get permission of all the singers, which were, were protected by SAG. So that they, they, and, and this one young man was, he just had over the years beat himself up for being on that song and he didn't want to allow it to be used. But I was able to share that story with him and he, he said, okay, We'll let I, nice. they can do whatever they want, but you know it's uh, it it becomes very personal sometimes these projects, and that when we did South Park, Mark Shaman kindly the, the couple of days before the scoring called to tell me that there was some language in the queue that some people might be offended by, so to be careful who I hired it with, who, who I uh, booked it with, and there was another episode of The Family Guy where we had a lyric that was you know, sacrilegious in its, in its satirical way. And uh, I knew it was, it, it was not going to be something that this one singer wanted to sing. So I had, I just said, you, you can sit out, sit, sit this one out. And uh, we did it without him. And then he came back and we did the rest of the cues. But I, I do another podcast with a friend of mine. It's all about geeks and nerd topics and stuff. <laughs> and one of the things we discuss quite often is how comedy is a reflection of our society and it can point out the faults in our society in a way that just editorialization does not. Absolutely. And yeah, that's some of these shows like the Simpsons, the things they do South park too, the things they do yes. in it to point out the stupidity of yes. our life and our absolutely. culture sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It allows topics to be discussed and, and, positions to be stated in a way that it's not going to offend the people who don't particularly feel that way. They'll, right. they'll go to the humor of it or they, they'll miss the point altogether, but it does allow those. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, now, did you write the whole book or did you use somebody like as a ghostwriter? No, I, like I wrote, the, I wrote the, nice. the book and I didn't want any help. <laughs> Good. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Thank um, you. I, okay, I've been dying to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, so, did you get to do anything on any Star Wars movie? Yes. Thank okay. you. Oh, that's awesome! I love that. <laughs> what, 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 can, what did you do? Well, you know, I, I sang on a couple of them. I sang on the series, but you know, I, I, I got to tell you, I'm 83. I will be 83 next next week on Thanksgiving. And well, I'm thankful. Oh, happy birthday. Thank you. Um, and so my memory for the early projects, it, the, the ones that I wasn't contracting, I sometimes I have to look at the list of credits to remember what I did or what, well, I, what I just loved. So, <laughs> you have a huge, huge list. So that's understandable. Regardless of age, yeah. it's much more forgiving being 85. I love that. I got another story to tell you about John. I, I sang for his uh, one of his earlier contractors, Janine Wagner, who was Roger Wagner's daughter. And she did some of his earlier films. Um, and then he's used the Master Chorale several times, too. But um, uh, what was I going to just tell you? Oh, my God. Uh, John Williams okay. story. <laughs> um, so for the, the second to the most recent Star Wars film, uh, Jedi, something about the Jedi. Um, the Last Jedi. The last Jedi, thank you. Um, my phone rang one day, and it was John, and he said, hi, baby, how many low B flats do you think we could find? And, and, and it was like, John, and this story is in the book. It was, it, that was, he was talking the way he would talk to his five-year-old granddaughter. It was just, that's what he does. He's just, so he calls everybody baby. Um, and so we did, I found 21 low B flat guys with the base in the base community here. And it, that's pretty low register. And what John had written for that film was not um, he had several cues, but most of them were this very sound, you know, which they uh, also used a couple of those cues in the next 
um, Star Wars, the more recent one they licensed to reuse. But um, yeah, that, that I'll, I'll never forget that call. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, uh, so we, we were talking a little bit earlier um, about the Iowa Writers Conference uh-huh. or uh, workshops. Is that the what? The, their, the program is the Iowa Summer Writing Festival, actually. Yes, that's it. Uh, so you've been involved with that for a very long time. So like you said, you've not been a writer by career, but you've been involved with writing. So tell us a little bit about that and what you did with that. Absolutely. Well, it, as you, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, um, Iowa, the University of Iowa is legendary. They're, they're, um, uh, I had known about it and, and I, and I, I knew I couldn't go away long enough to do a writing program, but I thought, well, I'll, I'll investigate the writers f- festival, writing festival. So I reached out to them and they asked me to send some material, which for most of those workshops, you don't have to do, but I sent it and I got accepted into the MFA uh, poetry program accidentally, <laughs> but I couldn't stay away from town. That was, uh, th- that was 22 years ago. And I was very, very busy and you just, you couldn't go out of town that long. Um, so I, I, did get finally into the writing festival workshops. And those are like five day and two day workshops over, they start in June and they go through mid July and you can choose, you know, two or three or one or all of them. So over the years um, I've done writing workshops that poetry, short fiction, uh, memoir, uh, personal essay, flash fiction, flash fiction came into being somewhere along the way. And I, and I, I did a ton of writing, but I didn't really submit much of anything for the first 10 years. And finally, at the end of one of my week of workshops, this Gordon Meninga, this dear guy, said, you've got to start sending stuff off. So I did. I sent a couple of, of flash fiction slash prose poems. They were just little, like a couple hundred words. Uh, I sent them off that night and then was to head home the next day. And the next day... I got a, an acceptance email from the place I'd sent it to, which was a, a journal called Hermeneutic Chaos Literary Journal. And they were based in New Zealand. I don't know how I found it. It was online or something. But so that that was so fun. So I thought, oh, this is great. And then the, I got about, over the years, I've had about 12 little stories and poems and essays landing in various journals. But the best lecture I ever heard about writing was in the earlier days there in Iowa, they, they did something called the 11s every morning, which is uh, during the week, one of the instructors would come and dip, give a lecture. And then the workshop started in the afternoon. And this one instructor walked into his uh, podium with a cardboard box full of letters. And he said, if you don't get this many rejection letters back, you haven't even tried. So I, I am not somebody that was good and still am not good about submitting. And I, and it really, you really have to find your reader. I've learned that you have to find the publication that, that, that likes the kind of stuff you write. And in that project, you have to do a lot of reading. So it's, um, it's, uh, and the workshops are fabulous. The workshops were wonderful. I, I did a few Zoom over the lockdown, but it's not the same as being in the room. You really get the vibe of how someone feels about your writing or how they don't feel. Agreed. And, and, and along that way, and I'm sure you've heard this from other writers too, you, you reach a point where you have to, have to realize that every comment in those feedbacks it shouldn't send you flying to the moon or into the dark cave. I mean, you, 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 you begin to trust yourself. And I have, uh, in addition to the memoir, I have another work that's kind of a long novella. It's about nine, eighty or 90,000 words, I guess, which is a bit long for a novella. But it's something I literally started back in the 80s when I was seeing a, a, a counselor who was brilliant but nutty as a fruitcake and he he would he, he you'd walk into his office and he would say hey, you're toxic toxic you gotta go walk the stairs and so i'd cycle the two or three floors of stairs and come back in until i wasn't toxic anymore 
And um, one day I, I, I was writing, I wrote this silly little story, which turns out to be the beginning of the, mem of the, the, the novella. And it's about a, a psychiatrist and a patient and she walks into his office and the first thing he notices is that she's got a fresh bullet wound in her forehead. And she says, oh, it was just my husband and I taking pot shots at each other. We'll be, he was fine when I saw him lying in the driveway. And, and I was trying to be sarcastic with him, but he said, you know, if you wrote a few pages like this every week at the end of the year, you'd be cured and you'd have a book. So I, I, I kept writing about this lady and it's a, it's a kind of magical realism book, but she has a lot of adventures. So that's my next project. I got to get that one out into the world. Therapist inspired stories. <laughs> yes, therapist inspired right. stories. And at the end of the book, he he's uh, he gives up his therapy and is playing accordion for parties, and she's all better. So, do you do you think uh, the creativity of singing applied to your writing? Do you feel that it's just another avenue to express yourself, or was it something you kind of had to work at? I I think, you know, I I think it. I think I was very blessed. My mother was also always had wanted to be a writer. She ended up after her singing career, she taught writing at North Hollywood High School here, and she books were we never had a lot of money in my household. It was a his, hers, and ours family. My mother and father were divorced. She married my stepfather. He had had two children by his first marriage, and then they had three more children. So we were a family of six kids. They worked freelance with their singing, and it wasn't always good times, you know. But the one thing I remember is that books, She they belonged to the Book of the Month Club. They And she was a beautiful pianist, and she also played the piano at night. But she, there were books everywhere in our house, and there are in my house. Some of them are hers. And I, I guess I just, the, the language part of it was never a problem for me. And I, you know, it was, it, Stephen, when I knew we were going to have this lovely talk today, I, I woke up for some reason thinking this morning about the fact that writers, no matter what they're writing about, are writing about their own lives in some way. And, um, you know, the emotions that we feel or we understand or we don't understand, those are the things we write about. The experiences will translate them into another character, maybe. Um, everything in Mrs. Billy's Lay was, was based on things that had happened to me, but I just tweaked them a little bit. And, and, and it's interesting, um, you know, that let me, I'm going to grab a book. Okay. Uh, you know, the actor Jim Carrey? Oh, yeah. uh, he wrote a book a couple of years ago that was released called Memoirs and Misinformation. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, damn, I'm going to get blamed for copying Jim Carrey if I ever get Mrs. Billingsley out there into the world. <laughs> because he, it's a fun book. But um, it's, you know, and I think uh, you were talking about the connection between music and writing. And I think that there is a, a, an instinctive kind of um, connection between that the the rhythm of a sentence the 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 phrasing the um and and i and one other thing that i i learned at the workshops which is very helpful with poems or any kind of writing is to read them out loud to yourself read the read your pages because i i find things when i do that that i miss on the page we get so used to looking at the page <laughs> that you don't you don't see it anymore. You just know, oh yeah, that's what I was talking about. Blah blah blah, and you know, right? Agreed. So you mentioned you've read a lot. What are some of your favorite books and authors? No, oh, I was afraid you'd ask that because <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember anything. You say, I, I, I uh, James Tate wrote is a poet. And he was the first poet I wrote that he, his book of, uh, I forgot what the title of the book is, but he, he wrote prose poems that were little stories almost. And some of them were f fantastic, you know, funny, interesting, satirical. Um, and that encouraged me with my flash fiction and poet, some of my prose poems. Um, 
mostly, honestly, I, I realize I have, I love reading biographies, memoirs and autobiographies. I love reading about people. Um, uh, I could go look at my shelf, bookshelf in the hall, but I don't want to leave the screen too long. Um, I, and I, I, Kurt Vonnegut, I read his, uh, uh, um, it was the famous book that he wrote about the, uh, the, the war, the, the, uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, uh, for, that, that was Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451. Oh, that, that's not the book I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, anyway. I, I, I have yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, I, I love Kurt Vonnegut. I, I, uh, um, gosh. I will, I'll look it up. I can uh, include a link. I'm, I haven't read a whole lot of Vonnegut, so I'm not familiar with his work, but I know well, a lot of writers love his work. Yeah. Uh, and, and the, the, what it, I was fascinated by was an article that I read about him. It might've been an excerpt from a memoir or an interview that he'd done, but it was, it came, the, the book I'm thinking of came about through his own experiences in the war in, in battlefield and, and seeing his colleagues wounded or killed. And, and I thought, you know, I, then I began to worry about, oh my God, you got to have really amazing experiences to write fiction, to build on that kind of stuff. And, um, this is embarrassing because I can't remember anything. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's not a problem. I don't remember everything. So um, I'll just, I'll look it up. I'm sure I can uh, figure out which book it was. Yeah. Um, but there are so many, uh, the writers, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't read as many of the classics, I'm sure, as I should have. I, I've gotten back into Shakespeare a little bit and I took a course, a Shakespeare course in college, but of course I've, I I don't remember a lot of it. Did, did you ever sing anything for any of the Star Trek movies or TV shows? Uh, the TV series, yeah. They they there were uh, they used vocals as underscore a lot in those some of those projects. So they yeah. weren't solos. Um, but um, uh, Jerry Goldsmith was he? Did he? What was this? Yeah, he did the series. Yeah, yeah. Well, because uh, I interviewed uh, Armin Shimmerman, who oh. uh, did Quark on DS9. He wrote a, a book where he took Shakespeare's Tempest characters and put it into um, the the history of the time period. So oh, wow. it's, yeah, so I did talk to him. So it's kind of a connection there. <laughs> oh, yeah, how fun. Um, you know, one of the musical projects I'm, I'm working on to help get accomplished is a dear friend, a choral, a uh, uh, classical composer has written three choral settings of three of Shakespeare's sonnets, and we're going to record those uh, in a few weeks with the choir here, and that's nice. going to be fun. Wow, yeah. nice. Um, yeah. So, do you have a website, Sally? I do. I have uh, several. <laughs> um, the uh, I have www Hollywood Film Chorale C H O R A L E dot com. And that's uh, something that, again, through John, I did a concert with him uh, back in 97, I think it was, some music from Amistad and other films at the Hollywood Bowl, and they needed the name of the choir for the program. And I did, we didn't have a name. We were just freelance singers that I'd gathered together. So I asked John if that would be okay. And he said, yes, and you, could, you should trademark that name because you could record under it. So I did. So we've been able to use that for screen credit all these years because the studios want to know that you own something before they put it on the screen. So there's that website. Um, then www.sallystevenswriter.com and um, www.sallystevensphotographer.com slash film scoring HTML dot, I mean dot HTML. Right, okay. Um, and those are the, the writers, the workshops, I mean, the, the, the websites, none of them are really up to date because I've been focusing on other things. The Hollywood Film Corral has a lot of information about film scores that I worked on and contracted. and um, But it it's missing a couple of the more recent ones. And then um, the Sally Stevens writer, I posted a lot of 
some blogs, some poems, some links to other writing that's been published. And then the the photography website is not completed. I, but I in in nineteen um, let's see it would have been twenty years, twenty seven, twenty two years ago. On my sixtieth birthday, I gave myself a couple of gifts. I did a cabaret symposium workshop on the East Coast. I did a photography workshop in the in the Loire Valley. And I, I had started taking photography lessons because I'd, I'd always been interested in that. So in about 2002 or three, uh, I began doing uh, black and white photography shots of composers on the scoring stages as they were at work. Oh, wow. And, and the photography website has about, I think, about 30 of those uh, with a little bit of credits about the composer. The first one I photographed was Jerry Goldsmith on the Paramount stage, which is no longer there. And then I photographed John Williams and Steven Spielberg on the so Sony stage. Nice. And, um, and then and over the years, Alan Silvestri, Mark Shaman, uh, James Newton Howard, James Horner, um, just wow. uh, Tyler Bates, the more recent composers. So that's the website that deals with the photographs of the composers. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you're naming all these composers because, you know, I, I watch a movie and I'm like, oh, I got got to see who was the composer. Yeah. 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 It, you know, it's so funny. In the olden days, you, you the lights were off until the credits ran. Now the lights come up the minute the credits start and people walk out and they I, I can't. I'm glued to my seat. I have to see who the musicians contractor was and who the orchestrators were and the engineers and blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, to be fair, uh, in the older days, uh, the credits would last a minute, minute and a half. Now they last like twelve minutes. So <laughs> that's, you know, that's true. that's true. And the and the uh, portable potties get credit, and everything gets everybody gets credit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. So all right. Well, um, I I just got to ask. Say no. Uh, but you mentioned the Simpsons. Mm -hmm. uh, you sang a little bit. Do you, would you sing just a line or two that you did for the Simpsons? Because that's one of my son's favorite shows. Uh, well, the, just the main title, The Simpsons, The Simpsons. Awesome. I, I love that. Um, he, he's going to be tickled to hear about that. And I, I love all the Star Wars stuff. Uh, oh. I appreciate you talking. We we didn't really split it up into two different episodes. We talked about your book and the, the writer stuff kind of all mixed up. So a little bit different of an episode. But I think that's great because mm -hmm. your stories are wonderful. I love that. <laughs> Well, I hope I didn't get too far off track. I, I, uh... Not at all. Not at all. Hi, if you enjoyed this episode of Discovered Wordsmiths, please support the author. Go to their website. Go to Amazon. Look them up. Get the book. And if you click on the link that I have in the show notes, you'll also help support the podcast so I can keep the hosting and all the software I use and uh, keep it running for, to help more authors. When I am recording this, we've got over 100 episodes, lots of authors. Go to the website, discoveredwordsmiths.com. Check it out. There's a lot of great authors, probably in some genre that you love. See what they have. Check out their books. That's what the point of the podcast is for. So people can discover new authors, find some new books they love, support the authors so they can continue writing. So please support them. And if you do like the podcast, if you've been thinking of podcasting or you're a writer, I've got some links also at the website. Click on those if you're interested in any of the software or services that I talk about. Everything that I have there is something I use, so I've got an affiliate link. Again, it's a little bit, if everyone clicked on those, if they were going to get it anyway, it helps keep the podcast going. So let's all help each other out and discover more. So, sorry, discover more, discover more authors to read. Thank you for listening to Discovered Wordsmiths. Come back next week and listen to another author discuss the road they've traveled and maybe sometime in the near future, it might be you.